Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Harry Shoemaker. I'm the editor and publisher of Beer Business Daily and Wine and Spirits Daily. And I'm uh, happy to uh, moderate this uh, distinguished panel. Uh, first, uh, a border to Kilareros, home brewers, prohibition in Texas. And our first speaker is uh, Dr. George T. Diaz, is an associate professor of history at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, where he teaches U.S. history borderlands, and a Mexican-American history. And his award-winning book, Border Contraband, The History of Smuggling Across the Rio Grande, is a social history of smuggling in the borderlands. And he is also the co-editor of a collection titled Border Policing, A History of Enforcement and Invasion in North America. Uh, Dr. Diaz's research is informed by investigations in Mexican and U.S. archives, as well as a lifetime of, of living on the border. Uh, Dr. Diaz, uh, welcome to our, uh, our, our panel, and please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you for having me. It's always an honor to uh, speak with, uh, you know, uh, audience who's interested in South Texas, borderlands history, and particularly smuggling, which is, you know, something that I'm quite fascinated with. Uh, in particular, I love the Witte Museum. I remember going there frequently as a as a child, and I, I'm only a pity that I can't be there in person today. Um, so today I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, my research on smuggling, uh, particularly about uh, prohibition in the borderlands. So let's go ahead and go to my first slide. So I was born and raised in Laredo, Texas, and that's, of course, community placed in the center of the map. Uh, so Laredo, Texas is a um, border community. It goes back to 1755. And it's also uh, on a Pan-American highway that connects North America together, first by railroads and then by highways. So uh, growing up in Laredo as a young man, I wanted to know about my hometown. And one of the things I was curious about in terms of the past was something that was a contemporary issue. And that was, um, that was smuggling. Smuggling is something that continues to this day, something I saw with my own eyes. And uh, growing up there, I kind of wondered how it began. So what I became curious with was the history of smuggling across the border. And of course, studying smuggling is something very, very difficult because it's something that, you know, is a clandestine activity. We only have records from people who are apprehended. So I thought, well, how can we study something that is a clandestine activity uh, and make it uh, and bring it into the light? So I thought I'd study smuggling in a period that which smuggling was rife, and that was the period of prohibition. Uh, prohibition is a time in U.S. history when the, the sale of alcohol uh, was basically uh, prohibited, it's prohibition, and that was the Constitutional Amendment. Now that Constitutional Amendment uh, was not popular in many parts of the country. There's you know stories of people in Appalachia becoming you know moonshiners. Uh, up in Chicago, people like Al Capone became very, very rich gangsters uh, by trafficking alcohol from Canada. So I wanted to know how this period of American history uh, played out along the borderlands, especially because uh, the, Mexico, uh, there had no laws there against alcohol. And many people in the borderlands of South Texas were Mexican-American Catholics, and uh, they still wanted to uh, a chance to, to get something alcohol to drink. And also many, many Anglos in Texas also wanted a chance to get alcohol. So what I found is that the borderlands became a site for trafficking as people from across Texas uh, basically went to the borderlands to get alcohol from Mexico where alcohol was still available. And there were these people in the borderlands, uh, tequileros, who acquired alcohol in Mexico and basically transported it into the United States for resale. So uh, this image is an uh, image that someone shared with me at a genealogy conference. And uh, what the picture shows is uh, these, uh, it's a post picture law enforcement. I believe the person there on the side of the picture is, uh, is a border patrol agent and has three men that have been apprehended for trafficking alcohol. And the term that uh, is used in the borderlands is um, tequileros or tequila runners, tequila traffickers. And what tequileros were, were basically men from the borderlands, many from rural backgrounds, ranching backgrounds, who would traffic liquor from Mexico to the United States on the backs of animals, mules, donkeys, burros, these kind of thing. And they themselves would ride horses and they would put uh, 
about 90 bottles of tequila on the backs of these uh, beasts of burden and go through the month, they go through the borderlands in order to bring it to US markets. Now, this uh, practice seems to be very, very rudimentary, but it was very, very effective in the fact that, uh, you know, these men could put about 90 bottles of alcohol on a mature animal. Uh, they would travel in uh, basically caravans of about nine or 15 uh, burros, and they'd be a company of about three or four tequileros who would basically escort the animals. And oftentimes that they would uh, pack this alcohol very, very skillfully by putting the bottles of alcohol in burlap sacks and often put the, like straw between the bottles to muffle the telltale clanking of glass. And in this way, we're able to traffic alcohol rather effectively through the brush country of South Texas um, under the noses of, of uh, Texas Rangers, of uh, the Border Patrol and the Customs Service. So let's see if I can go to my next slide. Uh, I like this map a lot. Uh, this map is uh, a map that is in a book called Horsebackers of the Brush Country. And horsebackers is a, basically a Texas Ranger term for mounted ethnic Mexican liquor smugglers. Uh, the author of that book is Maude T. Gillen. She was married to a Texas Ranger. She's also the daughter to a Texas Ranger. And her husband had fought tequileros. And based on interviews with him and other officers, she came up with this map and it shows basically Dickey Little Trails through the brush country. So I really like this map a lot because it shows you just how far these contraband caravans went. I mean, you're talking about from Roma all the way to San Diego Freer. That's a good 60, perhaps 70 miles, depending on how your path is. So it's a pretty great distance that these uh, uh, people were able to traffic alcohol through the brush country and also, it's important to note that um, smugglers, um, although they may be armed, are not actually looking for confrontation because confrontations are actually contrary to, uh, to business. I mean, smugglers work uh, clandestinely. The whole point is to avoid confrontation because confrontation would lead to basically a disruption of the trade. So I like these circuitous routes basically people going through the out of the way brush country trying to avoid detection, often working at night. And as you can see, uh, all roads lead to about Freer, San Diego. San Diego in particular comes up a lot in South Texas uh, history. And the reason for that is, is because you can only go so far on, you know, the, uh, t taking alcohol with animals, you know, they can only tra traffic liquor so far. So what these tequileros were, were basically um, middlemen or entrepreneurs, uh, basically uh, would go to Mexico, purchase alcohol in a store, traffic it, to about 60, 70 miles, and they take it to places like San Diego. And there they would uh, resell the alcohol to uh, uh, bootleggers, uh, guys who had trucks and automobiles, and they would basically take the alcohol off the backs of these animals and basically place this alcohol uh, in trucks, and bootleggers would then drive this cargo further using the state's road system. So the alcohol would go from there to San Antonio, Dallas, Corpus, Houston, what have you. So these tequilos were basically middlemen. So let me keep on going. Uh, I like this picture a lot. It's a picture of a US Customs agent uh, with seized alcohol. Uh, this alcohol was often uh, destroyed if it was not uh, consumed. Uh, here's a picture of uh, William Wright. He's a captain of the Texas Rangers, and he often did uh, mountain patrols uh, in the borderlands for um, these liquor smugglers. So, in terms of policing, um, uh, the Border Patrol does not exist until 1924. Uh, so they come on to uh, the stage a little bit later. The officers that are searching out for these smugglers are uh, US Customs Inspectors who are mounted, who would basically ride along the borderlands uh, looking for undocumented immigrants and also for uh, smugglers. And of course, the Texas Rangers. Uh, and it's important to talk about how these, uh, these federal police forces, the Mounted Customs Service, and the Texas Rangers often work in tandem because even though they're federal and state officers, there are distinctions, they often know each other through personal relationships. Texas Rangers become customs agents. Um, so they're, they know each other, it's a small world. Uh, the Texas Rangers have a notorious history along the borderlands for violence against uh, minorities, uh, Indians in the 19th century, uh, ethnic Mexicans throughout their entire history uh, were targeted by Texas Rangers. So the period of prohibition is the 1920s. Uh, 
Uh, if you go back 10 years earlier in the period of the 19 teens, the Mexican Revolution is going on, and there were uh, um, these border raids in the Valley of South Texas, uh, places like uh, McAllen, Cameron County, um, Hidalgo County, and the Texas Rangers went down there and killed hundreds of ethnic Mexicans on suspicion of, of, of banditry, they called it. So uh, hundreds died, if not more. And many of these officers who participated in these basically uh, terrible violence against ethnic Mexicans in the 19-teens continued to serve into the 1920s, which is the era of prohibition. So what happens is many of these officers who had killed Mexicans indiscriminately in the teens are still serving in the 20s and perceive these tequileros as the, the successors of sediciosos, of these quote bandits from the 19th century, uh, from the 19 teens, and can and basically seek them out and seek to destroy them. Um, here's uh, another post picture of Texas Rangers 300 quarts of tequila and 37 seized uh, burros that were apprehended in November 1921. So um, let's talk a little bit about sources in terms of like uncovering a history of smuggling, because of course studying smuggling is something that's a very, very difficult thing to, to unearth. Uh, we only have records where people were apprehended. Uh, and of course the most effective smugglers were never caught. So it's something that's difficult to study in terms of history. So the best way to study um, illicit trade or the history of smuggling is by looking at, you know, when people were apprehended, when there's confrontations, when there's court cases. Uh, and we could also look at, you know, stories like uh, like this one that appeared in the, New York, uh, in the Laredo Weekly Times in December of 1922. And this story's, uh, this article is pretty colorful. I'll leave it on the screen for a moment. It talks about three unidentified Mexican booze smugglers who are killed by officers. So uh, in terms of like using records to uncover a history of illicit trade, uh, in many cases, uh, English language newspapers rely on uh, law enforcement records in order to compose their stories. And then the newspapers would simply repeat what law enforcement said. So if you're doing research on smuggling, there's, a, uh, I guess, a bias towards uh, the state and law enforcement because those are the organizations that leave records. If you're involved in illicit trade, very rarely do you want to keep a ledger documenting your your deeds that you don't want to have come to light. So if you um, if you go down to the borderlands, you can actually um, uh, hear other versions of clandestine trade. And there's this wonderful tradition in the borderlands of ballads, of folk songs. Uh, so for instance, uh, there is actually a ballad called Los Tequileros are the liquor smugglers. And I'm going to play just a little bit of that song just so you get a little taste of it. So that Spanish language ballad is called Los Tequileros, and it talks about the death of three tequileros by three uh, rinches, or Texas Rangers, on November 3rd, and the year is not specified. So to make a long story short, there is this ballad about these three liquor smugglers being killed. And by doing oral history in the borderlands, I was very, very fortunate because I was able to interview uh, the living sister of Leandro uh, from the Corrido Los Tequileros. So this woman was in her 90s. She is from Zapata, about 60 or 70 miles from my hometown. And she uh, was she had a little ranch feed store. And I was able to interview her in 2003. And she told us about the time um, there was a knock on the door in uh, December of 1922. And Leandro, her brother, uh, basically uh, gets called upon by two men, Jeronimo and Silvano, to go smuggle some tequila. And according to the ballad in her memory, she said that uh, her brother didn't want to go because he was ill, uh, but eventually he's persuaded. And the men tell him something like, look, you could make some money if you smuggle some tequila with us and it's the holidays, you could you know, have a little bit of money in your pocket. 
So that's the story she told me. And uh, then she asked me if I'd like to see a picture of her brother. And I said, of course. And this is the picture you're seeing right now. And what I love about this picture is that the picture that was shared was a, a picture of a man on his wedding day. That this famous liquor smuggler who is immortalized in this border ballad does not have a bandolier, is not carrying a rifle. He doesn't look like, you know, like Pancho Villa or Danny Trejo. It was a person who saw an opportunity to make some money for their family and, and took it. Uh, and in doing so, uh, is killed. That's one of the consequences of having a song written about you. If you have a song about you, often you have to die in order to, to get that song. So um, I listened to that song and uh, the woman, the sister, basically met, said, if you go to the cemetery, you'll get a chance to see my brother's grave. So I went to the cemetery and I went ahead and I took a picture of his monument. And what I love about it is that the entire ballad is there on his stone. And you can see the Spanish language song is there. And uh, you can see his uh, widow or his, his wife is there lying next to him. So as a historian, I took the date off of that grave, November 3rd, 1922. And I tried to match it with English language newspapers uh, because on the ballot itself, there's no, there's no year given, just the date. So I went through all my records from local newspapers throughout the, dec throughout the decade of prohibition. And I realized that that story, that Corrido Los Tequeros is actually this story. And the reason why the months don't match November, December is because uh, November doesn't really rhyme well um, and I'm sorry, December doesn't really rhyme well when you sing it. And um, in this song, it's it's fascinating because it, it matches the story and the fact that three men die, but the way they are killed very much differs. So if you take a look at this newspaper clipping, uh, it talks about how, you know, basically the officers come across these liquor smugglers. They ask them to stop. Uh, the smugglers shoot first. And then, according to the newspaper, they bit the dust. Now, if you listen to the corrido and you, I guess, read Leandro's monument, the story is that the officers basically took them by ambush. And if you look at these folk songs where they call the officers cowards, where the song Los Tequileros talks about how they were, the, the smugglers were, quote, hunted like deer, you see that the story is told in many different ways, but the outcome is the same. The, the, the smugglers are killed. So what I did is I went ahead and I went through all the newspapers from my hometown for the decade of prohibition. And if you if you do that, you'll see that there's this formula in English language newspapers where officers come across smugglers. They're not suspected smugglers, they're simply smugglers in the in the newspapers. And they ask them to stop. And yet um, the the smugglers shoot. Uh, they always shoot first. But if you read those newspapers, uh, the smugglers always shoot first, but uh, the suspects are always killed. And if you look from 1919 when prohibition began to 1933, you realize that why is it there's this indiscrepancy between newspapers saying the suspects shoot first, but the officers are never wounded and the smugglers are always dead. So you realize that English language stories may not be telling an accurate version of events. And if you hear this folk song where it talks about them being killed by ambush, it, it, it better explains this discrepancy between violence between uh, smugglers being killed and officers walking away unscathed. So by about 1924, uh, the Tequileros are basically wiped out. They're killed by, by Texas Rangers and Mounted Custom Patrol who are out there doing these kind of, um, these kind of uh, policing, this violent policing. But prohibition goes on until 1933 so even though these these horseback liquor smugglers are wiped out, that doesn't mean that smuggling ends. It just basically becomes more sophisticated. So by the latter part of prohibition, you have the abandonment of horseback liquor smugglers, and you see people who are bootleggers using trucks, using cars, the state road system to traffic alcohol. This is a picture of Joe Hobrecht, who was trafficking alcohol, and actually was um, con um, uh, arrested for killing a prohibition agent outside of Persal and the latter part of prohibition. So smuggling becomes more sophisticated with automobiles. The people who are involved in this trafficking are actually more violent and take a much higher toll in law enforcement than the tequileros. And by the end of prohibition, the 1930s, you have even cases of airborne traffickers, people who are using airplanes to traffic alcohol. 
So um, smuggling is something that uh, is a cat and mouse game. Uh, the more policing uh, is effective, the more uh, the, the, it, it basically prompts uh, different manners to circumvent the law and it often becomes more sophisticated and violent. Um, so prohibition is something that uh, is a lesson that we have uh, much to go back and, and learn from. So I think I'll go ahead and end uh, now. It's a picture of my finished research if you're interested. So uh, thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, that's fascinating. And you know, one thing that strikes me as a uh, uh, as a student of prohibition, obviously that's my trade. And you know, all we talk about, like ninety percent of what we talk about during prohibition, is the illicit trade between Canada and the United States. You know, I mean, that's uh, that's how the Seagram family got rich. And and but the difference is, you know, coming across. Uh, to Detroit or Chicago uh, across the lakes, whether frozen or through a boat, there wasn't that racism factor, you know, and also kind of the Wild West where uh, it was kind of lawlessness is what I'm hearing. And um, uh, it's, a, you know, even though we had just as, uh, as strong as a trade in the South, nobody ever wrote about it. And like you said, it was all written by English uh, uh English language papers who uh, didn't really get the whole story. And I find that uh, very interesting. So um, uh, anyway, I don't have a question, but I'll have, I'll have questions at the end. But with that, uh, I just like, you know, like I, again, I just like to just pontificate uh, this with that. I'd like to introduce our, our next speaker. And Joseph Locke is an associate professor of history at the university of Houston in Victoria. He is the author of, Making the Bible Belt, Texas Prohibitionists, and the politiz Politicization of Southern Religion. And he's also the co-author of the American Yapup, Massively Collaborative U.S., uh, Open U.S. History. I, I bungled that. Sorry. Sorry about that, Joseph. But uh, the American Yap, a Massively Collaborative Open U.S. History Textbook. So uh, with, with that horrible introduction, my apologies. Let's uh, shoot it to you, Joseph Locke. Sure, no problem. Yeah, thanks for that. And uh, first, let me quickly thank uh, Mary Margaret and everyone else at the museum for uh, getting all this together in the middle of the pandemic. And also just, yeah, I regret that we aren't all able to meet in San Antonio and share a beer together as planned. Um, so the theme of this year's conference is uh, resilience, past, present, and future. And since we're talking about resilience in the context of prohibition, I thought today I'd build upon the themes George presented and talk about the ways in which what I'm calling a Texas beer culture was imported by German Texans, the way that beer culture shaped life in Texas, how it struggled under prohibition, but then how it survived and still lingers today. Now, I still, uh, I typically study the prohibitionists themselves. Uh, my first book, Making the Bible Belt, which is now available in paperback, uh, tried to understand how the white Anglo Protestant Texans who helped push prohibition through were able to achieve in the 1910s what seemed so impossible uh, just a few decades earlier. And what I found was that prohibition wasn't just a political question about alcohol. It had to do with ideas about race, religion, nationality, gender, even how we understand our own history. Uh, Protestant crusaders didn't just convince voters that alcohol itself was a problem. They convinced voters, and in Texas narrowly and amid the wartime hysteria of World War I, that to ban alcohol was, among other things, to strike a blow for white, native-born Protestant America against immigrants in their cultural worlds. It was, in other words, a culture war, one that religious conservatives used to catapult themselves into state and national politics. But there are other sides to that culture war. So I looked at how the politics of prohibition were wrapped up in the imposition of Jim Crow segregation, for instance, and how Protestant Americans used prohibition as a justification for, as George was talking about, increased border policing and more restrictive immigration laws. So African Americans in Tejanos were forced to confront the politics of prohibition, and they did so in a variety of ways, but they weren't the only ones. Um, the German Texans have faded, I think, in the state's consciousness as a separate cultural group, and that's largely owing to the reality of widespread acculturation that was enabled mostly by skin color, economic advantages, and distance from immigrant forebears. But the German Texans were distinct, and they laid the groundwork not only for Texas beer, but I think for the very culture of beer here itself. Their breweries and their beer gardens anchored a kind of communal life that persevered under the legal weight of prohibition. 
And I'd like to argue that even where German Texan ethnic identity has evaporated, and it hasn't fully, of course, not yet, uh, its legacies and its culture live on, and not just in Oktoberfest and heritage organizations, but in dance halls and breweries, uh, even in weekend afternoons spent with friends and family. Now, this beer culture began with German immigration. Uh, Texas fever, so-called, uh, gripped German emigres in the 1830s and 1840s, and thousands of German immigrants came to Texas uh, during the 19th century. Often immigrating with capital, they were able to acquire land, and they settled, uh, especially in Central and South Texas, uh, to the extent that many communities became little Germanys, and a so-called German belt extended sporadically, but uh, extended from Galveston to the Hill Country. When Frederick Law Olmsted, uh, he was famous for designing Central Park, but earlier he was a traveling anti-slavery journalist. When he toured Texas in the 1850s, he expressed amazement at the foreignness of the German belt communities, but also admiration for their kind of orderliness and work ethic. They're almost a kind of 19th century model minority. Um, and their numbers kept growing, uh, growing. A few thousand German Texans in the 1840s became more than 200,000 by 1910. They were still concentrated in the German belt where 10 counties claimed ger majority German populations, but also in South Texas cities. So San Antonio, for instance, was about a third German at the turn of the century. And wherever Germans predominated, German culture persevered. What Olmsted described in the 1850s was a little different from how others would describe the German built half a century later. There's perhaps no district of the United States, uh, one historian wrote in 1909, where the Germans have kept their racial characteristics to so great a degree. There you will see the German drinking his beer in small gardens. You will hear music as it is sung in the fatherland. You will hear the German as the common speech. You might imagine yourself in one of the little towns of Germany, he wrote. German Texans, in other words, they still spoke German, they still read German papers, they still sang German songs and ate German food, and they still drank German beer. Uh, Americans already drank beer, of course, but uh, it's fairly well known among this, the story of American beer very quickly becomes that of German immigrants. Uh, Bush, Anheuser, Miller, Schlitz, Pabst, uh, it was the Germans that built the first great commercial breweries in the United States. And they used it to make German beer, which is mostly lager, a kind of bottom fermented slower and colder brewed beer uh, that was lighter and crisper than most American ales. And that's kind of what conquers American beer and what Americans come to associate with beer. Uh, here in Texas, German immigrant William Menger launched the first commercial brewery not long after coming to San Antonio in 1847. Um, 15 years later, at the time of the Civil War, there's about a dozen breweries and then there's two dozen by 1870s, uh, by 1870. They're almost all owned and operated by Germans, and they almost all brew lager, but they're still generally small operations and they come and go. So during this time, there's as many as 50 and as few as eight operating at one time. And then in 1884, uh, the St. Louis uh, beer titan Adolphus Bush comes, partners with San Antonio businessmen and builds what was then the state-of-the-art Lone Star Brewery. Uh, two years later, the San Antonio Brewing Association founds Pearl Beer. Um, run especially by uh, the German-born Otto Kohler and his wife, Emma Kohler. Uh, that would eventually become the largest in Texas and produce 100,000 barrels a year uh, just before Prohibition. Though, again, most Texas breweries were smaller and more local, so that uh, all the major cities and most smaller German-heavy towns had their own, or even several at one time or another. But so German immigrants, they didn't just introduce large scale commercial brewing, they introduced, I think, a culture of beer, of both brewing and drinking. Uh, for Germans, as one historian put it, beer was a mainstay of their life and culture. It was a means to bring people together, a staple not just of birthdays and weddings, but of picnics and festivals and Sunday afternoons. Um, a German-American newspaper publisher and historian from Austin County, William Trenkman, wrote in 1899 that cheerful enjoyment of life after honest labor is the guiding principle followed by the people of our county. Uh, and as historian of the Texas Germans, Glenn Litch put it, what marked the German most of all was his passion for organized fun. So Germans organized shooting clubs, sports teams, and singing groups. They held dances and concerts. Um, they had organized Sunday get-togethers with friends and families, and they drank. Uh, they certainly had their saloons, uh, but it was the beer garden, I think, that typified the best of the German approach to beer and community. Uh, like Schultz's garden in Austin, um, uh, which was founded by a German immigrant in 1866, they were gathering places. There were venues for coming together. Uh, they were open and airy, unlike saloons, which were you know, criticized as being dark and exclusive. They had large tables under shade trees, uh, often built by fraternal organizations. They welcomed families, uh, unlike the saloons, which typically uh, barred women and children. Um, 
In fact, beer culture in general was more accommodating of women than the culture surrounding saloons and liquor. So Lone Star and Pearl, for instance, both explicitly to marketed uh, to women. Uh, in Galveston, German families banded together and formed their own Garden Varian, which a large scale organized social club. They built a massive pavilion and hosted concerts and picnics and dances uh, and served food and ice cream and, of course, beer. Uh, beer flowed freely outside of the beer gardens and saloons, too. Um, they were a main uh, feature of picnics, of weddings, fishing trips, birthdays. Uh, beer was essentially everywhere among German Americans. In fact, uh, you know, looking for pictures for the slideshow, uh, it's pretty hard to find pictures of 19th century German life uh, without at least uh, a handful of half full beer mugs being featured prominently. Now, uh, for a time, German Texans were able to insulate their beer culture against an accelerating push for prohibition. And prohibition was at its core a political question, but it entangled and so it politicized questions of race, ethnicity, religion, and nationality. Germans weren't just voting for beer, they were voting to affirm a culture and a lifestyle. Germans felt rightly, I think, that to defeat prohibition wasn't just to defend beer, it was to stand up for German Americans and German American culture more broadly. Resilience then was political. Um, prohibition was some German Texans' first real forays into state politics. Uh, again, William Trankman, the German-speaking Austin Colony newspaper publisher, uh, directed his first piece of political journalism against the enforcement of Sunday laws for saloons. The Germans and Bohemians of our part of the state had been keeping the Sunday as it was kept in their homelands, he wrote. All business houses and all saloons were wide open, and the laws weren't really enforced. As far as I can tell, Trankman said, the Sunday laws remained a dead letter for a long time. Wherever prohibition sentiment flared, German Texans mobilized voters. They held parades, uh, seen here. They supported anti-prohibition candidates. In 1887, for instance, Austin County, which is at the, uh, the eastern edge of the German belt, voted against statewide prohibition 2,987 to 325. Uh, several of the county's German precincts didn't log a single dry vote. Um, a couple decades later in 1911, the next time prohibition went to a statewide vote here, uh, and it was only narrowly defeated statewide, Austin County again voted 2,600 to 270 against um, prohibition. Germans at the same time statewide supported wet candidates like anti-prohibitionist governors Oscar Colquitt and James Ferguson, the notoriously corrupt but farmer-friendly anti-prohibitionist. Um, and they had help. In 1903, Adolphus Bush and nine bro uh, breweries underwrote the Texas Brewers Association, which bribed editors and politicians and paid the poll taxes for wet voters. It was a selfish and completely financially motivated effort, but there was also a cultural element to it. Uh, as Bush put it, besides losing our business by statewide prohibition, we would lose our honor and standing of ourselves and our families. And rather than lose that, we would risk the majority of our fortunes. Now, anti German sentiment has been here as long as the German has, uh, the Germans have, from the Know Nothing movement of the 1850s to the anti-unionist violence here during the Civil War. Um, and yet it was often difficult to rile Texans with fears of the Germans. They were here, they were mostly settled, they were prosperous, and they were really only concentrated in certain areas of the state. And then the First World War came. Had it not been for the outbreak of war in Europe, prohibition agitation here in Texas, mired in stalemate, might have subsided. But the nationalistic fervor wrought by entry into World War I changed everything. Texas banned the use of German in public schools. Towns and counties banned the use of German language, uh, the language itself. It was a misdemeanor in Austin, for instance, to speak it in public. Just outside of Corpus in Noises County, a Lutheran pastor was whipped for preaching in German. A sheriff in Bastrop County shot and killed a German farmer who refused to buy liberty bonds and was acquitted by a jury. Uh, Governor Hobby, who had negotiated to pass prohibition after Governor Ferguson's impeachment and resignation, vetoed appropriations for the entire German department at UT. Anti-German sentiment had taken hold, and the prohibitionists directed it at, then at the German brewers and the saloon keepers and the German beer drinkers. The Texas chapter of the Anti-Saloon League said that to talk now about patriotism and about our supreme task being to win the war and not to seek the immediate destruction of the German breweries and the German-owned saloons is to belie one's every word. Fighting Bob Schuler, who was a Texas Methodist that later became a leading American fundamentalist, would cite the German names behind American breweries. Do these sound like the names of men who love America, he'd ask? These are America's greatest enemies at home at the moment, he said, and fighting Germany at home would be a pretty good rallying cry. War hysteria ultimately enabled prohibition to win here. The states approved the 18th Amendment, and Texas very hastily adopted statewide prohibition itself, so 
mostly so that they could say they did it before the amendment did it for them. And so what happens then? Texans, of course, don't stop drinking, and German Texans absolutely don't stop drinking. Uh, the breweries that survive scrape by uh, selling near beer, ice, Cokes, ice cream. Uh, the Galveston Brewery Company made a beer called a near beer called Galvo. Uh, then they started making soft drinks mostly. Uh, after her husband was killed in a bizarre love rectangle, Emma Kohler helped steer the Pearl Brewery through Prohibition by brewing Triple X Pearl near beer and then selling ice cream and other dairy products, even doing dyeing and dry cleaning. Uh, over here, closer uh, to Shiner, uh, Cosmo Spetzel sold ice and near beer and rented out trucks to uh, survive. But even with breweries only producing near beer, which is a kind of low alcohol beer with no more than 0.5% alcohol, which was the legal limit under the Volstead Act, uh, beer drinking didn't stop. In fact, to produce near beer, you didn't really have to do anything differently. You just added an extra step to the brewing process. You brewed regular beer and then you boiled away some alcohol. And as one might expect, some of that beer didn't quite make it through that final step. Um, there was a man named Joe Green who worked at the Spetzel Brewery here during Prohibition. Uh, a lot of real beer went out the back door, he recalled a few decades later. Uh, the rest was bottled or stored in barrels and kegs at night, loaded on the trucks, and driven to Smithville, where it'd be unloaded onto the Katy Railroad bound for Houston. But even with the breweries slightly hampered by law, many Texans, German or otherwise, did what Americans had always done. They brewed their own. Uh, Green recalled, there was also a lot of homebrewed beer here. Uh, so many people made their own homebrew, he said. So the breweries, for instance, couldn't sell alcoholic products anymore, but they could still sell malt syrup, which is essentially a beer starter. And anyone could just walk into a store, buy a can of pearl malt syrup or blue ribbon malt extract, add some sugar, water, and yeast, and with just a little bit of work, they could be drinking beer a week later. Uh, one Texan recalled that many in his county made a living selling their homebrew, that folks would come by with their growlers and rubber hoses, siphon it out of the big crocs that they brew it in, or if not in their homes, it was sold relatively freely over counters at stores and cafes. Um, I mean, a lot of this history you hear over and over, it's mostly in kind of oral history um, and family history, but, uh, you know, the number of kind of family recipes for homebrews and the various quirks to deal with all uh, the different aspects of it, you know, they're bound across the state. Um, so unlike on the border in these German counties, you know, federal law enforcement was practically non-existent. Elected local officials, especially in the cities and especially in these German counties, they didn't, really didn't have any incentive to enforce the Volstead Act. So German societies, for instance, they still procured beer for festivals and get together. In Austin Colony, for instance, as uh, Walter Kompofner has shown, German societies even recorded their massive beer orders for their meetings and festivals in their official minutes. Um, in 1922, for instance, for an anniversary festival, they kept in their records their orders for 40 gallons of ice cream and five kegs of beer. Uh, and because it was the German belt, uh, they invited the sheriff and constable to join them. And so beer drinkers and beer brewers weathered prohibition. Um, Emma Kohler made sure Pearl survived. Uh, trying just about everything to make sure, you know, workers could stay employed and everything else. And since the federal government allowed brewing to begin before the 21st Amendment went into effect, uh, Pearl was able to dispatch 100 trucks full of beer the very minute Prohibition ended in Texas. But Prohibition did take its toll. I mean, it, brewers tried to find ways to get around this, but it decimated the state's breweries um, and opened up Texas even further to the big national breweries, uh, brewers. Um, Pearl, a reborn Lone Star beer, and Spetzel were the only breweries to survive deep in the 20th century, and uh, Spetzel is the only one to survive without going under or being sold out. Meanwhile, two world wars and acculturation had taken its toll on the German Texans. Uh, but by the 1950s and 1960s, especially as uh, white Americans watched the civil rights movements warily and so-called white ethnics kind of melted increasingly together, safe in their kind of white skin and identity, um, once again, you start seeing these loud celebrations of May Fests and October Fests. Um, cities began holding major celebrations, advertising them for tourists and out-of-towners, uh, and bringing thousands to places like Fredericksburg and the Braunfels. Uh, in 1978, for instance, the German Texas Heritage Society formed, uh, kind of blending a cultural and historical association that I think further solidified uh, the safety of that German Texan identity here. But I think I want to close uh, with the idea that resilience, uh, in this case, is, is more than marketing campaigns, I think, for like hill country towns or kitschy ads for dance halls. I think in terms of prohibition, it's instead something fundamental at the bottom of much Texas culture today. 
I, I think Texan, uh, the prohibitionists were more right about alcohol than a lot of folks care to admit. I mean, alcohol is destructive. It harms health. It harms families. It takes lives. But the Texas beer culture that the Germans worked so hard to build, I think, remind us that beer absolutely doesn't have to be a vice. It can be a very normal and healthy part of social life, something that brings people together. And while in the United States, the actual beer might have changed, right? The hops arms race is kind of overshadowed lager, at least in the craft beer world. And the brewers themselves might not even speak German anymore. But that German Texan beer culture, I think, is very much alive when, you know, Houstonians bring food and spend afternoons sampling beer at St. Arnold's or families spend a Saturday hiking and playing horseshoes at the Goliad Brewery. But it's also alive anywhere uh, and whenever families and friends get together on picnic benches under live oaks to talk and chat and meet, uh, to debate you know, politics and listen to music. I think ultimately that's what resilience looks like. Um, and yeah, I think it's the kind of thing I'll be looking forward to if uh, this pandemic ever ends. Uh, thanks. All right, well, uh, thank you, Joseph. Uh, that's fascinating. And, and as someone who's named Schumacher in San Antonio, Texas, and whose grandmother is Mexican, I think I can relate to both of these scenarios because <laughs> I do remember my grandfather saying to me uh, as a child that, you know, after World War II, uh, nobody likes Germans or Mexicans and you're both. So, you, you know, <laughs> you better get with it. So, um, and, and I, and we come from the beer industry and we remember those, uh, those hard times. And one thing that struck me about what you were saying is, um, how the Germans viewed beer drinking as a family affair. Yeah. And, you know, and that, you know, after prohibition basically ended that. It, it drove people into, into speakeasies and saloons where the children weren't invited. And then now we're seeing an opening up of, uh, of uh, tap rooms and brew houses around Texas that are open and, and and families are, are is family friendly. Is, do you see this kind of renaissance of, of, of just uh, time memorial repeating itself? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, of course, the Germans are not the only ones to associate like beer drinking and kind of family and community again. And I think that's not uncommon. But yeah, I mean, you go to kind of craft breweries today all over Texas. And I mean, most of them have playgrounds, right? Most of them have uh, swings. Most of them have uh, areas for kids to play. Um, you know, it, it's you go there during the daytime. You go with friends. It's just kind of, uh, um, you know, the point is to be with others, uh, which like right. I said, it, I think what everyone is missing right now in this moment. Uh, but yeah, I, th I think ultimately when you break it down, like I said, I mean, yeah, the world war is just making it impossible for Germans to be German any longer here in the United States in, in large measure. And I think it's that spirit of beer as kind of uh, something for the family, not just something for, you know, uh, men in the saloon. And it, I mean, it's, it's interesting with craft breweries too, right? I mean, uh, craft beer kind of becomes this kind of like white millennial male thing, right? Where, you know, we're obsessed with like the newest IPAs and everything else. Uh, but I think there's that other side of that that we always have to remember that it's, yeah, it, it, it's social glue. It's a way uh, to bring folks together. And I think that's the best part about it. Yeah. And, 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 you know, as you probably know, there's a huge, uh, uh, an issue right now within the craft beer community about making it more diverse. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're fortunate in San Antonio to have Weathered Souls, which is the master brewer is African American. And, and who would think that was, you know, in San Antonio? And he's one of the the, the biggest leaders in, in uh, spearheading that, that effort. Um, so, uh, George, I, I wanted to uh, ask you about the tequileros. Did they ever... Um, Think of coming across the Gulf. I mean, did you have anything? Do you have anything? Uh, any evidence of them instead of going inland through Laredo or Del Rio, of cutting across and coming into Galveston or Port Lavaca? Well, I mean, uh, Thick and Littles is a term referring to a specific um, okay. to smuggle. So uh, that, that's basically limited to uh, basically people using animals like burros and donkeys and, you know, these kind of things. So, I mean, there are people who, to, who traffic um, uh, alcohol via the Gulf. I know there's a wonderful Hemingway novel, To Have and Have Not, that refers to them. Uh, and I think oftentimes there's a terminology that changes. Like, I think they're often come rum runners. 
uh, perhaps because right. rum comes from the Caribbean. So rum right. burn is often a term that is referring to, I guess, waterborne or seaborne smugglers. Uh, bootleggers is often people who, who use automobiles, at least in the records that I've found, although they are airborne bootleggers. So thinking that those refers to uh, people who use animals to go through the countryside. And it's funny because oftentimes these tequilos are bringing whiskey. <laughs> so they're not whiskeros, they're tequilos because that's just the terminology. <laughs> right. So, they, I mean, they were bringing more than tequila. I mean, because oh, you, so you can make anything in, uh, out of uh, starch. That's okay. And, and um, so, when, you know, they like you said, they would kind of bring them maybe 60 miles into Texas, and then who were these people that were kind of the intermediaries? Do you have any more color about who these guys who were picking, who had maybe automobiles or trucks that would bring them to San Antonio to, or, you know, Houston to kind of distribute through the rest of the area? I really wish I knew more about them, but simply put, they're organized crime. And maybe they're not. I mean, so it's like, literally organized crime. Like the, the mafia in Detroit and Chicago and from Canada would distribute it. And we had our own kind of mafia, you know, ma whatever, you know, crime down here is what you're saying. Well, I mean, I, there must have been, because if you're coordinating drops and purchases and distribution in a time of prohibition, you're doing it with alcohol, that is the definition of organized crime. Now, right. perhaps it's not a, a violent cartel, it's not a mafia, but it's clearly uh, an organized form of business. So I think the best way to study smuggling is by understanding it as a business. And right. I think it was really neat to do this research because I was doing this in like 2016, 2017 when violence was just terrible in places like in places like Juarez. Uh, but by and large, smugglers really don't like violence because it's bad business. They seek to avoid detection. They, they want to circumvent the laws to confront law enforcement will only prompt more state scrutiny, more state violence. Uh, so uh, to answer your question about who's doing these distributions, I, I want to know more about them. And I and the, one of the reasons why I think there's less about them, because I don't think they're targeted in the same way these tequileros are. The tequileros are targeted and killed by federal and state police agencies. And I don't see like these networks of alcohol distributors being gunned out and left in the monte or out in the streets the way these guys are. So it's a... It, there's a discrepancy between state power and how it's used. And the hammer came down really hard on these tequileros. And you see that in like the in, in the newspapers you describe them as armed invaders. And these guys are not occupying space, they're merely trafficking liquor. Uh, so, but the hammer came down disproportionately on them as opposed to distributors who are most likely making quite a bit more money. Right, and, and the hypocrisy is, I mean, you could cut it, with butter like a knife because I mean you, you would think like the Texas you know the Texas Rangers were hard drinking <laughs> you know they were they were partaking in it and yet they were using that as an excuse to kind of hammer down on 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 these uh, poor folks who were just riding a horse across the border just trying to make a living right yeah they, they saw them as basically bandits um, this is, the, of course, the decade after the Mexican Revolution. They saw them as the successors of the Sediciosos, and they didn't really uh, think twice about shooting first and asking questions later. I mean, just to end on a happier note, just because this could be a very grim topic, there's this Texas Ranger named Jesse Perez who has a memoir, and he talks about the officers being frustrated by um, the Rum running, the, the lone Rum running jackass. And apparently you could put, I mean, boodles are very smart. You know, uh, mules are very, very intelligent animals. So what happens is they'll travel along a path they're familiar with and they'll just basically go by themselves. So apparently this one guy as a, as a, as a ruse or as a way to smuggle would take his animal into Mexico and then load it at night and then release it. And this animal by himself would walk into the United States and like a drone would smuggle alcohol without any kind of human intermediary. And then the officer would find this lone pair of like hooves emerging from the river and had been defeated by this jackass, which I think is just <laughs> He's like a, like a homie story. Story. you know, you know, I hope they gave him a lump of sugar or something. When he, got <laughs> he earned it. Yeah. No shit. All right. So, uh, okay. So we're, we're running uh, quite uh, short on time. Uh, so, Joseph, uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, you know, one of the things that I find fascinating about, you know, I think people don't even recognize how big of a German community we do have. 
particularly in like central Texas, you know, like, uh, you know, Bernie and Fredericksburg. I mean, you just look at the town's names and you, you realize that this has got, got a big German and you see it in the architecture and, and you even see it in the music, the, in Tejano music with the, with, you know, the bass, it's uh, got almost a polka, you know, flavor to it. Um, why would August or Adolphus Bush, who had a huge brewery in St. Louis, want to come down to San Antonio to put a bunch of money into, into the Lone Star Brewing Association? I mean, I know we have good water and a German community, but I, is that it? I mean... Or did he have a girlfriend down here? So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you know, we don't have a ton of time. But I mean, I think the question of like business, I mean, I think sometimes with like, the, especially like with craft beer, we think of this as kind of like this pure kind of business. But it's always been part of this, right? The brewers themselves were big business. Um, when Bush comes in, right, that's just when Texas, like the very railroad networks that are probably carrying, uh, you know, Georgia's uh, whiskey up to Houston and everywhere else, they're coming down from San Antonio and Missouri and everywhere, or uh, St. Louis and everywhere else. And I think that's uh, Bush's way that he wants to get in there and claim that market before anyone else does. Uh, that I think by partnering with San Antonio businessmen, by kind of getting buy-in from Texans, that he can kind of block that market off and make sure that, uh, you know, uh, it, it's not some other competitor that essentially takes over Texas. Because that's what happens, and that's what Prohibition does, right? It just wipes out all of these breweries, and we're left with, you know, Budweiser and Coors and Miller. Uh, for 50 years. Right. right. And thankfully, uh, I mean, those are great beers, but thankfully uh, <laughs> you have other options as well, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. Well, listen, guys, uh, what a great uh, presentation. I, I really appreciate uh, both of you. And I, I also like to thank the Witty Museum for putting this on. What a great uh, thing. And I'm sorry we couldn't be in person here in San Antonio, uh, where I've uh, uh, I, I live at the Pearl Brewery, by the way. I, I, it, I, I can see the San Antonio Brewing Association That's sign awesome. right out my window and, uh, and, and a block from the witty. So hopefully uh, next time, uh, Mary Margaret, we can uh, do this in person. But thanks, guys. And uh, I look forward to maybe meeting you guys for a real beer and a tequila. Yeah. Right. Sounds good. Thank you, Eric. All right.